to the uh, next lecture, which is titled Lupus Nephritis from Recommendation to Practice. I think a lot of you know Dr. Joanne Bargman, who is a nephrologist from uh, Toronto. Uh, she actually was uh, trained in Stanford University before moving to Toronto. She is well known in the uh, lupus nephritis field. She has public 200 publication plus. Uh, I'm going to start saying that uh, one of the uh, frustration I have since I came back from North America, she made me go like collect all the urine and go to look for all the cast, and nobody looked to cast in Kuwait. They were laughing at me, what are you talking about? There's a machine there. They said, machine is not as good. They were told us it's not as good. You have to go and collect. And every time I go and look to, oh, this is the cast? No, this is a dirt. And I get a head in my head. So the other thing, I, one of my frustration, there is so, the, my nephrology colleague was so resistant with biopsies. I keep telling them we need to know what we're treating, especially if we don't see the, the response. And you may not address this in this lecture, but hopefully at some point with a discussion, the role of the biopsy, even as a first biopsy or even a repeated biopsy. So, yeah, so we'll talk about this in the afternoon, but this is one of the, uh, my objective was to talk, to bring uh, Dr. Barman to address these two common questions. The third one was the 24-hour urine collection. Again, the, one of the new things I learned, they were dependent on the urine creatinine ratio more than the 24-hour, and they're so persistent about it and convinced me that you don't need to do it. It's not easy to do a 24-hour collection. So uh, we'll let Dr. Barman go through the uh, first lectures, and then we have also in the afternoon the other two lectures. Dr. Barman. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's uh, an honor to be here. I've been to many uh, countries in the Gulf area, but I've never been to Kuwait, so uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, yes, sir asked me to give these three talks, and uh, two of them were actually brand new for me. I, these are prepared, and I actually I learned a lot doing these talks, including this one, which is from recommendations to practice. So. What's so special about the year 2012? Well, you may have your own reasons for remembering 2012, but for the purposes of these talks, it's interesting that three different sets of guidelines were published in the world literature that related either in whole or in part to the treatment of lupus nephritis. So first was this from ULAR, and ERA is the uh, European Renal Association, European, European Dialysis and Transplant, Association, in combination with ULAR, came up with these set of recommendations, which I'll call the European guidelines. The American College of Rheumatology, led by the rheumatologist Bevra Hahn, came up uh, with these set of guidelines on, on lupus nephritis. And uh, there's a very interesting uh, uh, renal society called KDGO, uh, which is about impl improving global outcomes in uh, kidney disease. And they came up with a, a set of guidelines around glomerulonephritis in general, but there is a, an extensive chapter on the treatment of lupus nephritis. So this is the KDGO. So we've got the European ones, the ACR, and the KDGO. Now, uh, the authors of the European ones, uh, it's really uh, quite Catholic. It comes from 10 different countries. And when I looked at the authors, there again was a, a majority, but not overwhelming, of 17 rheumatologists, two pathologists, and 11 kidney doctors. Uh, the, interestingly, the American guidelines uh, were all, of course, Americans. And 18 of whatever, I think 25 authors, all came from UCLA. And uh, again, for perhaps like the European ones, the KDGO guidelines, were all kidney doctors, and they came from all around the world. So a little, a little, I think the American ones are a little parochial compared to the other two. And you know, it was the last set of American guidelines that led me to write this editorial that uh, Yasser alluded to before, because the first set of American guidelines on the diagnosis and treatment of lupus nephritis uh, had about 16 authors, 15 of whom were rheumatologists and one nephrologist. And I was really a little bit outraged. Can you imagine picking up a nephrology journal and finding a paper by uh, 16 nephrologists and one rheumatologist on the treatment of joint disease uh, in, in lupus? So it was, it, it's crazy. So that's what really uh, spurred me to write this particular editorial. So they were all independent of each other, uh, these guidelines. So it's interesting to look at all three and see what they agree on 
and what they disagree on. And really, in fact, uh, I had to go through and closely read all threat three sets of guidelines, and the big picture overall is not dramatically different uh, from each other. But I will focus on some of the differences and also give you my own opinion as part of this. So let's start with uh, class two lupus nephritis, which is so-called mesangial lupus, which usually is a very mild form of nephritis and doesn't ever or hardly ever lead to any kind of significant renal damage unless it changes its uh, class. Now, the American College of Rheumatology agrees with this and says it doesn't usually re require immunosuppression. KDGO also says uh, that only if it's uh, greater than three grams a day. I've never seen mesangial lupus with more than three grams a day. But anyway, if it did, then maybe they should be treated perhaps like membranous lupus or something like that. And the European guidelines do recommend prednisone for class two lupus nephritis in modest doses if there's more than a gram of protein a day. This is with no evidence and it stands out as being distinct from the other two recommendations. Now my take on all of this is that mesangial lupus is not, you're not gonna see a whole lot of it unless you've got a very low threshold to biopsy every lupus patient that walks in your door. And I'm not even sure that I would use ACE inhibitors or ARBs to try to reduce the proteinuria if it was less than 500 or even a gram of protein. And in fact, if I did see a patient with greater than three grams a day uh, of protein who had a biopsy that was read as mesangial lupus, I would question it and wonder if the pathologist was actually missing perhaps ultrastructural evidence of membranous lupus. So that's really my take on it. I, I, we really are not called on to, dwell, to deal a lot with mesangial lupus. Now class three and four, of course, is a much bigger problem. These are the most common findings on renal biopsy. And just remember that the distinction between class three and four is kind of arbitrary because it depends on the number of glomeruli that are involved. If you have seven glomeruli and three out of seven are involved, that's like a minority, so it's class three. If four to seven are involved and it's a majority, it's class four. So you can see it's, it's really the luck of the draw. So I think you should approach both of these uh, the same way. But both of these, of course, have uh, very significant risks of causing a lot of grief for the patient. So what do the guidelines have to say about that? So the American College of Rheumatology, to my surprise, and ULART, to my surprise, both recommend IV pulse steroids for these diagnoses. So uh, you can see slightly different uh, regimens between the two, and then switching to oral prednisone. Uh, I think the idea in ULAR is that if you pulse the person with steroids, then you can give them lower doses of daily oral prednisone after that. They recommend half a milligram, kilogram per day, and then a tapering regimen. You'll see that the KDGO guidelines recommend oral prednisone up to a milligram per kilogram with a tapering regimen. And uh, KDGO addresses pulse methylprednisolone and says really, and they're right, there's no randomized trials about this and to save it for more severe disease. So I was thinking about that and so you've got these two guidelines that come out with recommending pulse steroids and one that doesn't. And I must say, I go with the one that doesn't. And the reason is you've got to use your judgment. There is class three and four nephritis, and there's class three and four nephritis, and you really have to individualize the therapy to the presentation. For example, let me give you this example. You see a patient with lupus who has blood and protein in the urine, creatinine is fine. You see them a couple of weeks after they've been referred to you. You, you say, yeah, you've got lupus, lupus nephritis. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned. I think you need a renal biopsy. And then like a week later, you get the renal biopsy and there's a little bit of endocapillary proliferation and no glomeruli are damaged. So, you know, two weeks to see you and then, you know, well, you, you wait for the biopsy, then you get the result, then you see the patient. So is this an indication for pulse solumedrol? Does anyone think so? I mean, you could have seen this person a month earlier or a month later. So I don't think, to me, pulse solumedrol, because it's not without side effects. I've seen people get hypertensive crises. I've seen people go into acute respiratory distress syndrome with pulse solumedrol. This doesn't really seem to be a clinical uh, indication 
for pulse solumedrol. And here's someone that I would definitely treat, but I would treat with daily oral steroids. Whereas, there's a whole different patient who's in the hospital, sick with lupus, the creatinine's going up, you do renal biopsy and they've got active proliferative class 4 nephritis. This is a very reasonable indication for pulse solumedrol. So that's what I mean by there's class 3 and 4 and there's class 3 and 4. And to try to paint it all with one brush and to say, oh, you should give pulse solumedrol really doesn't seem to be right, right to me. And that's why I think you have to save pulse solumedrol for when you want intense uh, therapy quickly, such as the second scenario, but not in the first scenario. Okay, now we know from old studies that patients with class 3 and 4 lupus nephritis do better in the long term if their corticosteroids are combined with a second immunosuppressive agent. The early response to treatment will all depend on the corticosteroids, and I'll emphasize that again this afternoon. But in the long term, reducing risk of remission, perhaps reducing damage, it's important to add a second agent. So what do the guidelines have to say about the second agent? The American guidelines recommend either MMF or the Euro lupus protocol, which is cyclophosphamide, 500 milligrams every two weeks for six, so that's uh, over about three months, followed by either MMF or azathioprine or cyclophosphamide. The ULAR re regimen is MMF again or the urolupus uh, cyclophosphamide, and KDGO recommends cyclophosphamide, either regimen, the National Institutes of Health regimen or the urolupus, or daily oral cyclophosphamide, or MMF. So that's the recommendations. They're not dramatically uh, different from each other. And uh, frankly, I think as long as you add a second agent, I don't think it's all that dramatically different what it is. We know just uh, 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 empirically that uh, Asians can get away with lower doses of MMF than, for example, people of African-Caribbean descent. Uh, and I would stay away from cyclophosphamide-based regimens for people of African descent, because again, just observationally, it looks like it doesn't work as well in that group as in other groups. And there's probably very interesting uh, genomic influence here in the Gulf area, too, in terms of uh, genetic makeup and response to uh, immunosuppressive therapy. These are just two studies from uh, America to show you that uh, blacks particularly seem to not respond as well to cyclophosphamide compared to non-blacks. Uh, the first one on the left is a study uh, from North Carolina that showed that even under access to medical care, sometimes it's painted as a, as a sociologic issue, but we see the same thing in Canada where there's uh, free access to health care, that blacks tend to do uh, particularly worse and are especially uh, unresistant to cyclophosphamide. And, uh, Remember, there's a significant risk of amenorrhea and infertility with cyclophosphamide. The total amount of cyclophosphamide to be received before you run into problems with sterility is nicely worked out for children, but less so for young and middle-aged uh, adults. And of course, this is something in terms of patient reported outcomes that is very, very important for many people. I would recommend IV cyclophosphamide in patients who are non-adherent uh, or can't afford to take their medications, or you can't trust them to take their medications. At least you know if they've shown up for their cyclophosphamide or not, so you know whether they're resistant to medication or just not taking it. And uh, you could use cyclophosphamide in patients who just cannot tolerate MMF. And there's a lot of things you can do, like split the, uh, change them over to myfortic. Do you have myfortic here? In, in Kuwait. You can switch them to myfortic. Uh, you could give them a urolupus regimen of cyclophosphamide, or you could also give them azathioprine, which uh, uh, should probably be used more than it is already. So what about azathioprine? What does the ACR have to say about it? They say not recommended as one of the first choices for induction therapy. ULOR says that it could be recommended in milder cases, especially if the other two kind of induction drugs are not tolerated, and in KDGO it just says not recommended. So it's not really popular in the guidelines, 
but it still is a very helpful drug for uh, lupus, and it should be considered, especially if you have a patient who is pregnant or is going to get pregnant no matter what you say to them. Uh, if there's, as I said, side effects to the other drugs, and certainly in North America, it's less expensive than, than the other drugs. So it still has an important place, uh, in, certainly in our patients who, who are planning to get pregnant and they're on MMF, we will transition them to azathioprine and keep them on the azathioprine over the pregnancy. And I just want to point this out, because uh, I don't think a lot of people realize it, that um, this is the Eurolup Eurolupus study where they looked at high dose, the uh, intravenous cyclophosphamide versus low dose intravenous uh, cyclophosphamide, so-called Eurolupus regimen. And you know, the outcome in terms of renal outcomes were identical between the high dose and the low dose. Everyone said, look, low dose works just as well as high dose. But what people don't realize is that they only, the people in the low dose group only got the cyclophosphamide for the first three months. After that, they were put on azathioprine. So here's the first three months over there. And really, that low-dose group is now not on low-dose cyclophosphamide, but on azathioprine. And I get the feeling like azathioprine did all the work here for the low-dose group, but the low-dose uh, cyclophosphamide got the glory for this. So keep that in mind. This is really, I think, a high-dose cyclophosphamide versus azathioprine kind of trial. And uh, just while I'm on about azathioprine, you may have heard about this, and this study is used by a lot of people to say why they wouldn't use azathioprine in lupus. So this is kind of a weird study where they took people with lupus nephritis and gave them either cyclophosphamide and low-dose corticosteroids or azathioprine with high-dose steroids. I think they're thinking, well, azathioprine is such a weak drug that you have to counterbalance it by giving more steroid. But it really wasn't any kind of a level playing field. It was a kind of a weird study. And there was no difference in clinical outcomes, but when they did a follow-up renal biopsy, the azathioprine group had more signs of chronicity on their renal biopsies compared to the cyclophosphamide group. So again, the people who don't like azathioprine said, look, the, that group had, had more chronicity on their renal biopsy. But what people don't realize is that there was a follow-up study of the patients in the study. And in fact, even the azathioprine group that did have more chronicity at that two-year biopsy had the same level of renal function at 10 years. And the authors themselves say in the paper, it's clear that the renal biopsy does not predict clinical outcomes. So you can see that functionally, there was no difference between the azathioprine and the cyclophosphamide in this Dutch study. So this has to do with induction. What about guideline views about maintenance? The American College of uh, Rheumatology recommends azathioprine or MMF. No consensus on duration of therapy because no one really knows the answer to that. ULAR, continuation about MMF and uh, surprisingly less enthusiastic about azathioprine. Again, uh, no real consensus on duration of therapy, but thought that uh, when you do start withdrawing medication, you should start with the corticosteroid first. And then the renal one, the K-DOKI, recommends uh, azathioprine or MMF and low-dose corticosteroid for several years. Again, showing that we really don't know how long to keep people in remission on maintenance immunosuppressive therapy. So that's what I say here. My gut feeling is that probably MMF is better than azathioprine in, pre in preventing flares of lupus, but not incredibly better. Not so much so that, yes, you have to stay on MMF even though you're miserable with GI symptoms and things like that. MMF is just so much more superior than azathioprine that you have to stay on it. I'm being sarcastic. The point is that it's not a dramatic difference between the two. And if someone's having a lot of GI intolerance to MMF, you should give consideration to switching to azathioprine. Again, also, uh, if you think the patient is going to go ahead and is at a high risk for an unplanned pregnancy, it's better if they get pregnant on azathioprine than if they get pregnant on MMF. And then again, in Canada, it's cheaper to be on azathioprine than MMF, and it's better 
by far to be on azathioprine and take it than to be on MMF and not take it because it's too expensive. As Paul alluded to, we, we uh, continue therapy for many years. You can't really make a recommendation. And when we do start withdrawing immunosuppressives, we tend to taper the corticosteroid first, then the second immunosuppression. We will leave antimalarial on for, for years, really. Now, what about, you know, I said there's like, there's bad, there's three and four, and there's three and four. So what about the bad uh, three and four? You know, the ones associated with renal failure, heavy proteinuria, and crescents and necrosis on, on biopsy. So they do address this, and ACR just says, really, even in this, they would recommend the same uh, uh, oral steroid induction, ULAR the same. But remember, in ULAR, their induction is pulse solumedrol for everybody, which I disagree with. And then in KDGO, uh, this I really don't understand, because some of the studies from the NIH had patients with really bad lupus nephritis, and they were studies with cyclophosphamide. They said maybe if someone's got bad lupus nephritis, you should use IV cyclophosphamide. But again, it's just a recommendation. There's like no evidence to back it up. So it's not obvious to me that bad disease needs more toxic medicine. People uh, innately seem to come to that conclusion. You know, there's a, uh, there's a cough syrup in Canada called Buckley's Mixture, and their advertisement for it is, it tastes really bad, so you know it works great. And that's kind of the way I think people feel about cyclophosphamide, is it's such an awful drug that it must be really good and treat the, the worst kinds of lupus nephritis. And in fact, it's not clear to me that that happens. The other worrisome thing is if you give cyclophosphamide intravenously, you give it and then you have to live with the hematologic consequences. And uh, when someone has got a diminished glomerular filtration rate, you don't know what that white count is gonna be in 10 to 14 days. And you can try to adjust the dose for the decreased GFR, but in my experience, it's very unreliable. Furthermore, you can give pulse one of cyclophosphamide, get an okay white cell nitre, give the second dose, get an okay white cell nitre, then you give the third dose, and all of a sudden the white cells go down to zero. So it's very unpredictable. I would say if you really are uh, dedicated to the idea of using cyclophosphamide in the face of bad lupus nephritis, you should probably use daily oral cyclophosphamide because at least you can track what's happening to the white count as opposed to the pulse where once you give it, you have to live with the consequences. Uh, other things that uh, reviewing the guidelines, I just want to tell you I don't totally agree with, and that is to use renin and angiotensin inhibitors to reduce the protein area. That may be, but there's really very, very little evidence to support this. Certainly in people with diabetic nephropathy, where there's something called glomerular hyperfiltration, where uh, there's just more blood flowing through the glomerulus, and that is felt to contribute to the progression of diabetic nephropathy, ACE inhibitors and ARBs have got a role there because they hemodynamically reduce the hyperfiltration. Whereas in lupus nephritis, it's a whole other cause of the proteinuria. It has to do with damage to the intrinsic uh, permeability of the glomerulus itself. So it isn't clear to me that changing blood flow around the glomerulus itself is going to reduce proteinuria, and even if it does, that this helps the kidneys. It's something we reflexly do. There's really not such a big problem in doing this usually because many of these patients are hypertensive anyway, but I don't know if we're really helping the patients. I, I disagree about statins for uh, lipid abnormalities uh, just because it's one more pill to give to a patient who has hopefully a transient uh, problem. Uh, I disagree about targeting the blood pressure to less than 130 over 80. Again, hopefully this is just a transient problem. Calcium, vitamin D, and interestingly, like nobody mentions about pneumocystis prophylaxis. I mean, nobody knows what to do about pneumocystis prophylaxis, but it, it, uh, to my reading, I couldn't find it addressed in any of the guidelines. So why I disagree like with the statins and the calcium and the vitamin D and all that 
is that we know from the literature that the more pills you prescribe a patient, the less likely they are to take them. And really, what you really want the patient to do is to take their prednisone, take their second agent. That's like the most, and if you start throwing at them, oh, and I'm gonna give you this, oh, and I'm gonna give you that, and, and this and that, I'm giving you calcium, vitamin D, proton pump inhibitor, septra for pneumocystis, but all of a sudden, you're throwing a bushel of, of pills at these patients, I just worry that they're gonna get overwhelmed and not take anything. You know, if someone's on high-dose prednisone, they've got nephritis, and they've got a blood pressure that's uh, higher than the general population, I think it's not the end of the world. I would certainly watch it, but I, it's not the end of the world if someone transiently is hypertensive. And same with the, the lipid story, too. So that's why I disagree with those recommendations. Now, what about guidelines around membranous lupus? This is a lot more difficult because uh, there's way fewer studies, very few studies around membranous lupus. So it presents as uh, usually as nephrotic syndrome, although you can have subnephrotic uh, proteinuria. You can have concomitant microhematuria with membranous lupus, and people always assume because there's blood in the urine, this must be class three or four, but in fact, it can be uh, membranous lupus. Very interestingly, these patients often have normal complements and often are anti-DNA antibody uh, negative or very low amounts. And also, very often we see this, you don't see this, but we see this, they present with no one's ever diagnosed lupus because they've never had any manifestations of lupus and they come in with pure nephrotic syndrome. And the only thing is that the anti-nuclear antibody is positive and there are histological evidence of lupus kind of membranous nephritis on the biopsy. So how do we treat this particular one? The American ones recommend half a milligram per kilogram of uh, prednisone, uh, ULAR, uh, says the same thing, also suggests calcineurin inhibitors or rituximab as uh, alternative options for non-responders. And KDGO says corticosteroids plus a second agent. And there's, there's all the lists of possible second agents that uh, you could use. So uh, why is MMF recommended? Well, because it's just as, their, their rationale is that it's just as efficacious as cyclophosphamide, but with fewer side effects. And I'll show you the study that has to do with this. So this is amazing that uh, this escaped reviewers. So this was uh, one of the uh, um, MMF trials, and they looked at, uh, they took out the subset of patients with membranous lupus nephritis, and they looked at the group that got MMF and the group that got cyclophosphamide, and said there was no difference in the rate of remission. In fact, all these patients got a nice dose of prednisone as part of this uh, treatment. So maybe, in fact, it was the prednisone that did all the heavy lifting in this trial, and uh, the fact that there was no difference between MMF and cyclophosphamide was because they really had no additional benefits uh, aside from the prednisone, but that wasn't even addressed as a possibility in this paper. So like I'm saying, Prednisone and cyclophosphamide work the same as prednisone and MMF, so the authors concluded cyclophosphamide is just as good as MMF, but what if there had been a third arm of prednisone and Coca-Cola and would have had the same result? Would you say that cyclophosphamide is the same as MMF, the same as Coca-Cola? So my point is that maybe it was the prednisone that was important in the remission of the membranous lupus. And then the other study they used came from the uh, NIH, and this is uh, 42 patients, uh, and they looked at, unfortunately, alternate day prednisone. And this is left over from some studies in the 1980s. So alternate day prednisone with IV cyclophosphamide or with cyclosporin. Did I mention it was alternate day prednisone? So this is a really problematic study. Uh, nonetheless, you can see that the alternate day prednisone uh, had, uh, had the least chance of remission at the bottom. IV cyclophosphamide and cyclosporin had better chances compared to alternate day prednisone alone. And uh, this is uh, a study from Brazil, where they have a lot of lupus patients, where they compared prednisone to prednisone plus a second alkylating agent and found that prednisone worked uh, the same as prednisone with a second agent. So they suggested uh, prednisone monotherapy may be effective 
for this. So that's really a, a run through what's generated in all those 2012 guidelines. Let me just emphasize the important points. High dose corticosteroids should be used for induction in class 3, 4 lupus nephritis. And I think that the choice of pulse solumedrol versus daily oral prednisone should be guided by the cl your clinical judgment and the clinical presentation. I showed you two vastly different presentations of uh, class 3 and 4 lupus nephritis. You should use a second agent, and this really depends on the race, whether they can afford to take it, and of course, the importance of fertility. Don't forget about azathioprine, I call an old friend. It's kind of like, because it's old and it's cheap, nobody cares about it anymore, kind of like hydrochlorothiazide, but it's still a really a, a good drug and we shouldn't forget about it. And it really isn't clear from the current studies and I don't think is justified in two of the guidelines that lupus membranous needs treatment with a second agent. Thank you very much. I think you probably has created a lot of a question with this, a lot of controversy. With I, I was a little bit surprised. So I'm, I'll let the, the audience see if they have any questions, then I'll ask mine questions. Any questions? Um, you see a lot of patients, lupus patients diagnosed with lupus nephritis based on a positive histology. Thank you for the question. We don't see that a lot, uh, actually. But if there were a persistently negative ANA, I would also question the diagnosis and also go over the renal pathology myself. You know, the quality of the renal pathologist is very important. And uh, sometimes you can end up giving someone totally misguided treatment because of a, a, an inaccurate reading by the renal pathologist. So I think it certainly is worthwhile to go over it if someone is ANA negative. But you know, if they've got everything else going on that just smells of lupus, and sometimes I say, well, if it's not lupus, it's something really close to lupus. And you know, if, if there are troublesome renal manifestations, then it's probably worth treatment. Does, does that answer your question? Okay, yes. You know, it, that's such a great question, and the short answer is, as you know, there is no data on this, and no one really knows. Uh, what we do, and I know Paul does the, the, the same thing, is, uh, well, first of all, are they still serologically active versus did they used to be serologically active and now they've become serologically inactive? Personally, and I have no evidence to back this up, but if they were serologically active and now their complements are perfectly normal, their anti-DNA is like very low or, or undetectable, I feel more comfortable in starting a slow taper of, you're saying the second agent, right? Like the MMF or whatever. Uh, I feel a little more comfortable doing that. I also discuss it with the patient because, uh, you know, some patients had such a terrible time with the lupus that they'd rather stay on the immunosuppressive drug. Others want to get off it uh, if they can. So you've got to find out where the patient is, is coming from, because like I said, there's no evidence to help you guide your, your judgment anyway. Let's say both you and the patient think it's not a bad idea to start tapering it. We'll probably do it after about two years, maybe three years uh, in, in these patients and do it slowly. I, I don't, again, maybe you could just go from MMF two grams to stopping, 
But what we tend to do is to start decreasing it, you know, to, from, two, from uh, one gram BID to 1,500, 1, then 500 and 500. It's like you're trying to fool the immune system by slipping out the, the uh, MMF over time. But that's kind of what we do, but we, we do it for a long time. You know, it's like when, if a patient comes in with diabetic ketoacidosis, you don't say, oh, doctor, when can I stop my insulin? Like, this is a lifelong disease, and, uh, you know, perhaps in some people, you, you come to know their pattern, you realize every time you attempt to even stop the prednisone that they end up flaring. So each patient is different. Some may be able to come off everything eventually. And I have one patient who I've, I've learned can never come down below 15 milligrams of prednisone every day, no, no matter what else we've used. That's like her, her magic number. And it just it took years uh, for me to, to figure that out. As my current partner says, uh, every lupus patient has their minimum dose of prednisone. In some people, that's zero. They can get off it completely. And in others, that might be something else, like five milligrams or, or 10 milligrams. And you just have to get to know your patient. Does that answer your question? Okay. I have questions. The, we were disappointed the, uh, with the rituximab trials when they're using for lupus nephritis because they couldn't reach their statistical significance. And I guess we can talk about why, because the remission criteria was so strict. But there is a British uh, rheumatologist who just published a case series using a very small dose of, of uh, steroid, I think it was a 500 times one or two, and then put uh, rituximab and everybody got excited. Obviously, this hasn't made it to the uh, guidelines yet, but what's your take on that? I tell you why, because this is, in this part of the world, pregnancy is an important thing. They won't take cyclophosphamide. MMF, they're going to have that long discussion about, okay, let's get put the disease in remission for a year, then more can, can we be even faster? So there is a push, even from nephrology colleagues, to go to rituximab. So I just want to know your take on that. Uh, the rituximab studies is, are very interesting. This is the idea of uh, they give a pulse of steroid with a rituximab and repeat again in, in 14 or, or 15 days. So they do end up getting a gram of uh, solumedrol, and then the rest is just uh, rituximab. The results are very encouraging, and this is very interesting. For some reason, not just in membranous lupus, but even in the proliferative lupus. So we'll have to see. I mean, early reports of everything are always really great, but this is certainly something where all watching uh, with interest. In terms of the safety of rituximab in pregnancy, it's still early days. I And I just, uh, as a matter of fact, I just emailed our pregnancy person about rituximab uh, before I came over for a patient, and there's still no strong data. You can't give rituximab to a patient with the absolute reassurance that this is going to be fine for the pregnancy.